you ever uh, wonder whether we should have a building or not, that pretty much answers that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was thinking about your sermon last week where you talked about they met at a meeting place and then they at the river, and uh, I'm glad we're not meeting at the river. <laughs> Open in Scripture, Genesis 50, verses 19 and 20. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for I am in the place of God. Let me start that over. That's a question. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for I am in the place of God. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you. We are here today, and we can break the elements and, and be here and, and uh, have a place to meet. We're blessed with that. And, uh, be together, and encourage each other to get through this winter together, and uh, help us through our other struggles in life. And be here for each other. And thank you that uh, we have songs that we can sing to you that also encourage us to uh, be together. We ask that uh, you be with those who are not here for reasons that you know. We can be mindful of those reasons if, if we're able and to reach out and be of assistance in any way we can. We ask that you be with Phil as he presents a lesson today. And pray that uh, we can be mindful of that and that uh, our hearts can be uh, tuned better toward, to you uh, from what we hear today. We lift your name up in song at this time, and it's through your son's name we pray. Amen. Six fifty. Be our first song, and if you would stand for this song, that'd be great. We'll get that out of the way. <coughs> There's a call coming, ringing over the restless waves and the lights and the lights. There are souls to save, send the light, send the light, send the light, send the light, and bless the gospel light, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Now we 
we go back to number 415. <clears throat> and you notice we've got a bunch of them right in a row, but we're going to sing all the verses. So. so if you want to place your marker at 414, page backward, you'll be all set for that. All right. Number 415, or 416 first. 415, right? That's right. I can't read my own writing. That's bad. <clears throat> Each step I take, my Savior goes before me, and with his loving hand, he leads the way. Oh, 
Jesus, where they go? By and by to the shining portal, turning our feet, we shall walk with the glad immortals, heaven's golden streets. test, because every time we do a song like this, if it's kind of in a row, you try to see if you're still on key. <laughs> Sometimes it's not easy. But we're doing pretty good, I guess. Sweet are the promises, kind is the word, dearer for the any message man ever heard. Your was the mind of Christ, endless I see. He, the great example, is a pattern for me. Where he leads up all the way. Where he leads up all Follow Jesus every day. Sweet as the tender love Jesus has shown. Sweeter far than any love that mortals have known. Kind to the erring one, faithful is he. He, the great example, is a pattern for me. Where he leads a somewhere else because they'll tell you something different or at least slightly different but it's a beautiful day today albeit a little on the chilly side shall we say I think it was minus two when I got up this morning minus three for Jonathan yeah it warmed up as I was getting here because it got up to three above by the time I got in the parking lot it's uh Hey, it's winter. It's better than it was four years ago when Marie and I went up to Jackman for Christmas because it never got above zero a whole week. In fact, the nights were down to like 30 below, I think. We had to buy a new battery to come home. <laughs> it, yeah, it was, <clears throat> it was one of those experiences. Um, Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for bringing us together this morning. Thank you for this place that we have that we can meet in and worship you and encourage one another. Thank you that we have heat today. 
that the furnace is working today. We pray that that continues as well. <coughs> Father, we, we, uh, we just thank you for all the blessings that we have. Some of the things we just, we don't even think about as blessings, and yet we have them, and they are all from you. Father, we just thank you for watching over us and protecting us. Father, I ask that you be with me at this time that I give this message that I prepared. I just pray that, that I can speak your words and that your message will shine through in spite of my weakness. And Father, most of all, I thank you for your son, Jesus. It's in his name that I pray. Amen. Have you ever thought about how to show what things look like in the three-dimensional world on a two-dimensional surface? Okay, that, that, that sounded a whole lot more complicated than it really is. <coughs> Let me try again. Um, have you ever thought about how to make paintings or drawings look realistic? Uh, when, when you look at things in real life, close things look bigger than distant things. Shadows all go a certain way, depending on where the lighting is. And there seems to be a specific point on the horizon where things start to disappear. Artists call that perspective. And painting and drawing with perspective is actually a relatively recent invention. I didn't know this until earlier this week, last week. It wasn't until the Renaissance in the 1400s that artists discovered how to represent perspective correctly. Before that, important people and important things in art were just bigger than other things, and unimportant things were smaller, generally speaking. Some artists tried to make things look realistic, but they didn't always get it right. The math of perspective really isn't that complicated, at least it doesn't seem like it now. But before somebody figured it out, it was something that most artists <clears throat> didn't think about or even tried to do. They just painted and drew the way that they wanted to, and they didn't really try to make things look realistic. So according to dictionary.com, Artistic perspective is the technique or process of representing on a plane or curved surface the spatial relations of objects as they might appear to the eye. Specifically, the representation in a drawing or a painting of parallel lines as converging in order to give the illusion of depth and distance. Basically, when you draw or paint considering perspective, everything converges at what is called the vanishing point, because things that are farther away are smaller than things that are close, eventually getting so small that you can't see them. Now, there's another definition of perspective that we use as well, but it's not related to art. Perspective is a mental view or prospect. It's how we perceive things in life. Not just what we see, but what we hear and understand. Our perspective on life influences how we act and how we react to different situations. So as we're studying Paul's letter to the congregation in Philippi, we start to see more of Paul's unique perspective on life. His interaction with other people, and his place in the big picture of God's plan, or at least Paul's perspective on his place in the big picture of God's plan. Now remember, as we're reading this letter, Paul is in prison, probably in Rome. According to Luke's writing in the book of Acts, Paul was arrested in Jerusalem during a riot in the temple. He was kept in custody in Jerusalem by Roman soldiers until word of an assassination plot reached Paul, and he shared that with one of the centurions, who told the tribune, basically the general in charge, 
The Tribune then sent Paul to Caesarea, accompanied by, well, a, a small security detachment. 200 soldiers, 200 spearmen, and 70 horsemen to keep him safe. Just a small security detachment. Paul spent more than two years awaiting trial in Caesarea, but he appealed to Caesar in Rome. So the governor, the new governor, sent Paul <clears throat> and some soldiers to Rome. But they were shipwrecked, shipwrecked and spent the winter on the island of Malta in the Mediterranean. When they finally reached Rome, Paul was kept under house arrest, probably near the headquarters of the Praetorian Guard, the emperor's personal army. Just a, another small security detachment of 4,500 soldiers to protect the emperor. You would think that after all that, Paul would question his plans to spread the gospel to the Gentiles throughout the known world. But none of this discouraged him. In fact, Paul seemed to be encouraged by everything that was happening to him. I'm going to pick up reading in Philippians chapter 1, starting in verse 12. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Wait, what? Paul sees the good in all of the bad things that have happened to him. And a lot of the bad and a lot of bad things happen to him. Not just what I've already mentioned. If, if you look at Paul's second letter to the congregation in Corinth, more bad things happened to him than Luke writes about in the book of Acts. Let's take a look at 2 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 24. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. That's 39 for those who have a hard time with quick math. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, dangers from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Wow. <laughs> All that hardship. And still, he kept going. And now he's writing to the Philippians that all these things, all these events that caused him physical pain and agony, have served <laughs> to advance the good news about Jesus. How can any of this have been a good thing? Are you crazy, Paul? None of this sounds like a good thing to me. Beatings, shipwrecks, danger working around every corner. But Paul is saying that it's all good. Why? Let's keep reading. Verse 13. So that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. Paul wasn't keeping his Christianity a secret. He was living his Christian life openly, even though it would put him in danger. In fact, he made sure that all the guards that watched him knew why he was there. Paul was there in Rome, awaiting trial before Caesar because he preached Christ everywhere he went, including in the temple in Jerusalem to the Jews. And the Jews wouldn't accept that Jesus was Messiah because Jesus did not fit their understanding of what Messiah was supposed to be. Messiah was supposed to be a powerful king who would free the Jews from being under the thumb of other nations. And Jesus didn't do that. Paul said in the introduction to his letter that he was a slave to Christ. But he was more than that. 
He was a prisoner for Christ. The only reason he was in prison was because he boldly spoke the truth about who Jesus is and why he came. Verse 14. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Paul's imprisonment emboldened the other Christians there in Rome to speak out about Christ. Why would they be encouraged to speak out about Christ if Paul was put in prison because of it? Because Paul had unprecedented access to a group of people who never heard the gospel and never would have heard the gospel if he had not been arrested and brought to Rome for trial. Without all this happening, the gospel would not have been discussed among the emperor's private soldiers. Not only the Praetorian Guard, but even the household of the emperor himself, the gospel of Jesus was being talked about. <coughs> now, that doesn't mean that these people were becoming Christians. The entire household of Caesar was not immersed like the Philippian jailer's household was, although that would have been nuts. But the seed was being planted. Paul understood that his job was to sow the seed, not harvest the crop. He was sent to bring the gospel to the Gentiles, and that's exactly what he was doing. And he was doing it in a big way. He had been given access to the most influential people in the known world, and he wasn't being quiet. He was taking advantage of that situation. He was making sure that everyone who came to him knew why he was there. That made other Christians more willing to take risks to share the gospel. Verse 15. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. So there were two camps of people who were preaching in Rome. Paul called them all brothers, but they weren't all preaching to help Paul. Some considered themselves rivals with Paul. It seems like they were trying to do something, anything, to outdo Paul. They weren't partners with him. For some reason, they felt challenged by what Paul was doing, so they had to do more. But the <clears> other group was sharing the gospel because it was the right thing to do. They were living a Christian life. They were telling people about Jesus because that is how we're supposed to live as Christians. We are supposed to be examples to people because we are supposed to be living our lives like Jesus lived. Verses 16 and 17. The latter do it out of love. That's the latter would be, would be the ones doing it out of goodwill. The latter's do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. It seems the brothers preaching Christ from goodwill were, were doing it to try to help Paul and out of love for other people. We're supposed to live our lives showing the love of Jesus to everyone. I Trust me, I know that can be hard sometimes, but that's what we're supposed to do. These people were doing that even in Rome where Christianity wasn't very well accepted and at times was even considered to be a crime, at least during Paul's lifetime, things would get worse in the near future. But the first group was preaching Christ with the intent of making things worse for Paul. They were either trying to make Paul look bad, or they were actively spreading lies about Paul. 
but Paul still referred to them as brothers. And they were still trying to spread the gospel, even though their motivation was wrong. Now the first half of verse 18. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Paul didn't have a problem with brothers who were preaching Christ but doing it selfishly. Maybe they were bragging about numbers of conversions. <clears throat> Paul's perspective was simply that it was good that the good news about Christ was getting out, no matter the reason behind why it was being preached or how. Even if Paul was being hurt by what was being done, he was okay with it. He was more than okay with it, in fact. He rejoiced because the gospel was being preached, and that was his goal. I wonder what Paul would say about some of the televangelists over the past 50 years or so. I wonder what their motivations for doing what they were doing was. I know that there have been news stories about televangelists who embezzled money from what they were collecting from their viewers or never actually used it for charity purposes at all. There have been many other people who have been led astray because of the love of money or other things. Now, I don't profess to be perfect, but I think my motives are right for what I'm doing. I know it's not about money. It's about the gospel. It's about getting the gospel out there so that people hear it. And maybe, just maybe, God willing, they become interested in learning more about who this Jesus guy is and why people have been following him for about 2,000 years or so. Now, some in Rome were preaching the gospel to try to hurt Paul somehow, but that just didn't matter to him. Now the last part of verse 18 through verse 20. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the saints, this, sorry, and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body whether by life or by death. No matter what happens, Paul says, I am focused on serving Christ. Since he started out this letter by saying that he was a slave to Christ, here he's reinforcing that claim. Paul doesn't know how this trial is going to turn out. He doesn't know if the brothers preaching the gospel for their own selfish ambition we're going to hurt his chances for a positive outcome at his trial. But that didn't matter to Paul, because the gospel of Christ was being preached in Rome, for whatever the motives of the ones who were preaching it. Paul's hope was that no matter what happened, that Christ would be honored. If he were released, that would be great. <laughs> And if he wasn't released and was sentenced to die, that would be okay too. All he wanted to do was honor Christ. Whatever his will for the out whatever his will, Christ's will for the outcome of imprisonment was, Paul was ready for it. And he was willing to face good or bad and honor Christ through that. Verses 21 through 24. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which, shall, which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. And 
there's the reason behind it. We've all heard verse 21, probably many times. To live is Christ, and to die is gain. But what is he talking about? If Paul were to be acquitted, he would be able to continue preaching the gospel, whether in Rome or some other place. In his letter to the Romans, long before he was arrested, he wanted to go to Spain to preach the gospel there. Maybe that was still his plan. Whatever his plan, he was ready to do whatever God had in store for him. When he says to die is gain, he knew that if he died, he would receive his reward. He was confident in his final destination. So no matter what, he would continue to serve Christ. He knew it wasn't his choice to make. He knew there was a plan and that God had the ultimate determination for what was going to happen to him. And he accepted that. He didn't know what was going to happen, but he knew that God had a plan. And he was willing to go with whatever that was. But he did say that he would prefer to remain alive and keep working keep sharing the gospel with people and encouraging those congregations that he had started over the many years of his travel. Verses 25 and 26. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Now, Paul was convinced that God was going to allow him to be acquitted, that he would leave his house arrest and eventually come and see the first congregation that he started on the continent of Europe, the Philippians. At least that's what he wrote to them. But we don't know for sure what happened. Legend says that he was released from his first imprisonment in Rome only to be arrested again and eventually beheaded for the crime of preaching the gospel. Or in, in Roman ter terms, endorsing a religion not accepted by the Roman government. Now Paul's perspective on getting the word out about Jesus was different than most people thought it should be. Yes, he knew that there were false teachers, and he confronted those false teachers. But if they were preaching the truth about Jesus, even if they were doing it with the wrong motives, he saw it as a good thing. Because people were hearing about Jesus. Paul's take on getting the gospel out was similar to to the change in art during the Renaissance when people finally figured out how to paint and draw using perspective. Paul could communicate the truth about Jesus. If some people could get the start of the story out, someone could finish the story for them. If you could start drawing the picture, someone can finish the painting. And when it was done, Everyone could see the picture the way that the artist saw it before the work was started. It's not that Paul didn't care if he lived or died. It's obvious that he wanted to live so that he could continue to preach and encourage the congregations that he started. But dying wasn't a bad option. Dying meant that he could go home and be with Jesus for eternity. Paul had an eternal perspective. He realized that we live on this earth for only a short, finite amount of time. Our physical lives have a specific beginning and a definite ending. We all live and physically die. But Paul's perspective was that, was that no matter what happened, he wanted his life or his death 
to bring glory to Jesus. The way he shared the gospel brought glory to Jesus. And when he died, I'm certain that Paul, just like Paul was, that he went to be with Jesus for eternity. And that should be our goal, too. We should remember verse 21. And we should live our life by this verse. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. So can you say that and really mean it? I mean, really mean it. Is that the truth for you? the way that it was for Paul. If you're in Christ, if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, that is, trying to live a Christ-like life, then you should be able to say that and mean it. But if you have any question in the back of your mind as to whether that verse is true for you or not, then you really need to start doing some soul searching. Are you living for Christ? Are you doing what you're supposed to be doing? Are you trying to live your life by reflecting Jesus at every chance you get? Or are you living for yourself? Trying to get the best of what you can get and living by the motto, whoever dies with the most toys wins. Because that's one of the biggest lies of all time. Stuff won't save you. Having the most toys doesn't make you win. Living with Jesus is how you win. If you know how to live for Jesus, how to live in him, fantastic. Hopefully you're doing it. If you don't know, you need to figure that out. If you want some help, let me know. And we'll see if we can get you going in the right direction. Let's stand together. Interesting about that perspective thing. We used to do that all the time when we were doing drafting in school. Yep. Not pretty neat. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere he leads me in this world below. Anywhere without him here his choice would be. Anywhere with Jesus I am not.
Three points. Help us prepare our minds for the Lord's table. We saw thee not when thou didst come to this poor world of sin and death, nor yet beheld thy cottage home in that despised Nazareth. But we believe in thy footsteps trod in streets and plains, the Son of God. But we streets and plains of Son of God. We saw thee not with lifted high amid that wild and savage crew, nor heard we that in glory cry, for if they know not what they do. But we Bill said this sermon uh, made me think of this. He said, I hope I get this right, that uh, Paul was prepared for whatever came at him to make changes and and be prepared to do what needed to be done. And I started thinking about these things. As much as I do not like these things, which I don't, there are some people who are prepared that a pandemic was not going to stop us from meeting from meeting, excuse me, and uh, doing what we're about to do. And that takes, uh, that takes leadership. And the songs that uh, Jonathan picked out uh, this morning was all about following Jesus. If you follow somebody, that means they are your leader. Um, I know nothing about drawing and painting. <laughs> I was terrible at it. And I envy those uh, just like watching people who, who can. Um, but Growing up, uh, one of the things my father always taught was how important leadership is. And uh, probably under a different perspective than following Jesus, but uh, still. Um, so I'm going to get a little ahead of you, Bill, and go into Philippians chapter 2. We talked about our leader. 
Your attitude should be the same. Uh, the, excuse me, Philippians chapter 2, begin at verse 5. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And that's where all the things that we try to learn and strive for to be better people lead to Jesus' death on the cross. So that in our failings, which we have many, I know I do, we are forgiven for those in our attempt to, in our, in our following of Jesus. And we do this weekly to remind us of that, so we do, so that we don't forget. the cellophane on. And we have this uh, wafer of bread to remind us of his body that was broken on the cross. So let's, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come to you at this time as a body of believers in your son's death, very own resurrection. And we can sing songs about our, our belief. You know, while we didn't see it, we still believe. But we thank you, Father, that in our belief, we still are reminded weekly that we can meet together and, and be reminded of his body that was broken on the cross for this, for this piece of bread <coughs> that represents his broken body. Help us, Father, at this time to be mindful of that as we partake together. We pray through his name. Father in heaven, again, we continue our thanks in this time together as we remember his blood that was shed, your son's blood that was shed on the cross for our sins, that, that washes our sins away so that we can appear pure before you. And while it's so hard to, to grasp and understand sometimes when we think about uh, our families, we rejoice, Father, knowing that we are forgiven. And again, we pray that we Remember your son's blood in a way that is uh, worthy of what you need and what you, what you request. And we pray through his name. Amen. stand for this song as well. 712. <coughs> I think this was Christina Perry's favorite song, I believe, if I remember right. Trouble sometimes are here, filling men's hearts with fear. Freedom we owe, fear comes to sin.
suspect some of you probably thought the same thing that I thought. How much is that going to cost? Is this a big problem or a little one? And that gets down to what we do at this time. If we want to have this building, if we want to uh, have wonderful sermons like we just had, etc., etc., uh, this is how we do it. And so we take this time now to give back a portion of uh, what we've earned this week or The instruction is to give from the heart, so let's pray. Father in heaven, we come to you now with thoughts of all that we have, and what the needs of this congregation are. We pray now, Father, that as we take up the, this collection, that uh, our hearts will be in the right place, and that when it comes time to, to spend the funds, that we do so wisely and prudently, and we seek out the needs of others as well, that we can Remember to stay focused that uh, these funds are also for to help those who are in need. So we pray for your, we thank you for your blessings, but we also pray, pray for your guidance in this, in this matter as well. We pray through Jesus' name. Not as organized as I wanted to be. Um, Jonathan, that last song. I want to point something out on that last song. So if you if you could go ahead and open up the song books to seven twelve again, and then don't look at the, the words to the song, but look down at the very bottom left of the page. Because it has the the author's and composer's name and the date that it was written. The song was written in 1942. Put yourself back in 1942. England was worried about falling, being invaded by Germany. They were being hit with, of all things, missile attacks, which we don't think about. Japan had pretty much taken over most of the Pacific and had already attacked U.S. base in Hawaii. The world was falling apart. And then you look at the words of this song, troublesome times are here. Troublesome times have always been here. And we are living through them now, which is probably why Jonathan picked this song. <laughs> uh, but, you know, life is always going to be a challenge. We're always going to be faced with challenges, and 
just like Paul. With God's help, we'll make it through, or we won't. But either way, we need to glorify God. Um, okay. Announcements. Today is January 16th. Uh, if, you, if you looked at the calendar inside the bulletin, today is Jeremiah and Ashley's anniversary. Happy anniversary again. Um, today is also Colby <coughs> Wysoric's birthday. Colby's not here, but happy birthday, Colby. Um, and after Bible study today, we will have a student ministries meeting downstairs. Uh, we have food, so don't worry about lunch. That's, that's been provided. So please stay for the student ministries meeting if you're involved in that. And uh, that'll start at noon-ish. Uh, tomorrow's Frida's birthday. And, and I know there's a time frame where you don't celebrate birthdays and then you start celebrating them again because every year is a gift. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you're there yet, Frida, but tomorrow's your birthday. Hope you have a happy birthday. Uh, Tuesday is an important day for me because I'm having back surgery. It's also my birthday, so I get to have back surgery on my birthday. Hopefully it's a good thing. Are you at a point where you're celebrating each year, or are you the one that... You brought know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it up. Yeah, I did bring it up. It's, it's, this is going to be the uh, 30th anniversary of my 29th birthday. Yeah. <laughs> Makes people do math. Um, Wednesday's Kelly McLaughlin's birthday, and we will have Bible study starting at 7 o'clock. And then Thursday... Ashley's in here again. Hmm. Ashley and Andrew's birthdays are Thursday on the 20th. Uh, next Sunday, worship and Bible study at the normal times. We will have potluck at noon. Between worship and Bible study next Sunday, we will have our annual corporate meeting, which should last all of about five minutes, if that long. Uh, and then we will have our quarterly business meeting after potluck. So next Sunday is going to be a busy day. Um, the following Sunday, we will have freestyle worship because it is the fifth Sunday in January. So every fifth Sunday, we have freestyle where we share Bible verses and just pick songs at random and encourage one another. And then we have <coughs> the finger food gathering downstairs afterwards and then we get to go home. Um, let's see. We need to schedule a work day soon to put the walls back in. I got a text from Joseph this morning. He said he was not feeling well, so he stayed home, and hopefully he's on Zoom right now. Um, but. We need, to, we need to schedule some kind of time to get together and fix the walls in the basement now that Casey Hacker has fixed, hopefully, the flooding issue in the basement. Um, we'll probably talk about that at the business meeting next week. Um, Dottie called me yesterday. She wants prayers for her brother John, who's in the hospital. Uh, he just had leg, leg surgery. I'm not exactly sure the details, but she would love, she wants prayers for John because he's not mentally doing well being, he, he, kind of like me, first to be alone. <laughs> and, and he lives in the middle of nowhere, so he has to go through rehab and all this other stuff before he can go home. Um, there's the prayer list is, is at the point where I actually had to shrink the font again even being on its own piece of paper so Frida my sister Vera is in the hospital in Rockland waiting to go to Portland for surgery on a blockage to her heart valve okay 
So your sister Vera waiting for niece. three? My niece Vera. Your niece Vera, okay. <clears throat> Thank you. So Frida's niece Vera is in the hospital in Rockland and is awaiting transport to Portland for heart valve surgery. Not transport, Space. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, anything else you need to be concerned about? Closing scripture is from Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I know you sang it. I sang it in my head. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for blessing us with another day. Thank you for bringing us together today. We just pray that as we go, that you will go with us, that you will protect us from harm and from the evil one, that you will help us forgive others the way that you forgive us. Thank you for blessing us and caring for us. And Father, help us to share our blessings with others. Help us to reflect your light into the world so that they can see Jesus and want to know more about him. Help us to live the gospel so that others can see it. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week. What did it say?